Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us right on time, right on the dot. We're just going to give you a few seconds to trickle in for everyone to join. I'm seeing some familiar faces, familiar names rather, I'm not seeing your faces, but, uh, and some new names. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'll just take a few seconds um, to mention that you will notice the webinar chat is turned off. You're in listen mode only. However, please feel free to utilize the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the webinar at any point if you have any questions, but also comments to the panelists. Um, many of them will be answered live, so please make sure to take that opportunity um, to give your feedback live. But also, although the, the chat function is turned off uh, for you to use, you will see our team post some helpful information. So please um, take a note whenever you see uh, chat messages. Those might be helpful. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and begin. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Marina Tkachenko. I am the Development and Communications Manager at KBFUS. It is my pleasure to welcome you at our last webinar of 2023, uh, but not last webinar ever. We're really excited to close off this season um, with an important webinar that I know many of you have been excited to hear about on the topic of leveraging diaspora giving. Um, and before just we jump into that, I'll just take an opportunity to remind you um, of what, what we do if you're not familiar or if you need a refresher. The King Padwan Foundation United States, or KBFUS, and Give to Asia facilitate thoughtful, effective giving across borders. We enable U.S. donors to support their favorite causes overseas and provide foreign nonprofits, such as yourself perhaps, with cost-effective solutions to raise funds in the United States. KBFUS and Give to Asia are founding part members of Myriad, the Alliance for Borderless Giving. The Alliance aims to encourage, stimulate, and facilitate cross-border philanthropy, providing streamlined services and flexible tools to both donors and nonprofit organizations. And if you have any further questions um, about what we do, our services, and if you would like to connect with me, you will see uh, my contact info in the chat box throughout the webinar. Um, so please um, feel free and I look forward to connecting you about that. But now I'm eager to pass um, the word to Liz who will moderate today's session and also will go ahead and introduce our panelists and take over from here. Um, please, Liz. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Marina, for the introduction. I'm Elizabeth Ngonzi. I'm the moderator of this series, um, also co-developer, speaking on behalf of the International Social Impact Institute, for which I'm the founder and CEO. We are proudly thankful to KBFUS and Give, Give to Asia for enabling us to collaborate on this webinar series. We're genuinely thrilled to welcome participants from around the world today, whether you're joining us live or catching up later. A special appreciation goes to those who've been part of our previous programs. Your steadfast support means the world to us. Today, we explore an important topic, the pivotal role of diasporas in fostering economic development in their countries of origin. Get ready to uncover the secrets of diaspora philanthropy. Please don't hesitate to ask your questions in the chat and our team of experts uh, will be um, here to address general, general inquiries. And later, as Marina mentioned, during our dedicated Q&A sessions, our esteemed panelists will delve into more specific queries. As a proud member of the Ugandan diaspora, I am deeply honored to guide this conversation. Now, allow me to introduce three remarkable individuals who bring a wealth of experience and expertise to our discussion. Joining us today are Diane Yuan, 
who is a renowned strategist and philanthropy expert with over 25 years of experience in fostering innovation and creating impact worldwide. She's a co-founder of Daylight Advisors, a Give to Asia board member, and has made significant contributions to the field of philanthropic advising. Next, we have Heba Saeed Rashid, the founder and CEO of Marcel Foundation, who is internationally recognized for her work in healthcare and her commitment to serving marginalized communities. Marcel is a beacon of hope for those in dire need. And last, but certainly not least, we have Martin Russell, the founder of Global, of Global Diaspora Insights, who has conducted extensive research on diaspora engagement in philanthropy. His expertise in this area has informed policies and strategies worldwide. Let's hear from Deanne, Heba, and Martin as they introduce themselves further and share their in invaluable insights. Deanne, would you like to sh share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, Kivjanisha and KBF uh, for pulling us all together. Um, just briefly, uh, I have been a fundraiser, done plan giving, been a philanthropy advisor, philanthropy consultant, and now I teach. Um, so specifically, I teach advisors, especially uh, wealth advisors, uh, state plan attorneys, tax attorneys, um, in helping families figure out how to have those philanthropic conversations, and then also to strategize um, in terms of working with global families, how we can actually be much more effective in our philanthropy. Um, I myself am a Vietnamese Chinese uh, a diaspora, uh, family's Chinese. I was born in Vietnam and grew up in Michigan in the US and I'm in San Francisco right now. So. I love that, right? We just have the whole diaspora uh, covered on this in this webinar. Thank you for sharing that. And Heba, we'll come to you now. Okay. Why don't we go to Martin first and we'll turn Sorry. it to Heather. Oh, are you there? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Mercel. Uh, Mercel is an NGO specialized in healthcare. We provide uh, medical services for any poor patient in Egypt, regardless nationality or uh, religion. Now we have more than uh, 100,000 patients from 54 nationalities who live uh, in Egypt. And um, um, Marcel has nine years now. I established it nine years ago. And now we have a charity NICU clinics and establishing pediatric hospital. At the same time, I, uh, I finished my master's degree in linguistics. And now uh, I study another master in Oxford in healthcare leadership. You clearly don't have enough to do in the world, right? <laughs> Thank you for everything that you do uh, to, to really create transformative change uh, in your country. Uh, let's go ahead and hear from Martin, please. Thanks, Liz. And just to echo the ends and, and Heba's words, you know, thanks to the team behind the scenes because putting these things together are never easy. So uh, thanks to everybody involved in that. So look, I'm a bit of a reluctant academic at heart, you know, so uh, completed a PhD on diaspora strategies and conflict transformation uh, many years ago now at University College Dublin at the Clinton Institute. And one of the key areas within that research was the role of the Irish diaspora and diaspora philanthropy in North America in the peace process. And I know we have a mutual friend in that story in Chuck Feeney yes. was from, oh, from many, many years ago. So look, last kind of 10, 15, 20 years, been traveling the world, living out of a suitcase till COVID hit, you know, helping governments, private sector foundations around the world figure out this topic. And I think that the conversation today is so timely because... 15, 20 years ago, when you said you worked in diaspora, people thought it was a tablet that you take for a headache, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I think it, it, it's gone mainstream now, you know, so I think uh, we're, we're on the cusp of something really exciting, I think, in terms of diaspora philanthropy, we're not there yet, we look forward to kind of unpacking that over the next hour or so and leaving some wisdom, hopefully. Awesome. Thank you very much. Now we're going to delve into our panel discussion covering key topics related to leveraging diaspora communities for philanthropic, philanthropic support. And as you can tell, we're in really good hands. Um, so let's dive in with our first question, which is really about the role of diaspora communities in philanthropy in general. So how does an organization based outside of the U.S., with zero ex experience in fundraising with its, its diaspora, begin its work in identifying its diaspora, reaching out to US-based diaspora. Uh, what resources should they consult? For instance, local diaspora associations, embassies, even corporate connections. Dan, can you take that first and then Hebel will hear from you and then Martin. 
apologies. My, my perspective is mostly on the um, Asian American and mostly Asia, or called the transnational families perspective. Um, for, for, you know, starting with the Chinese, because the Chinese has, uh, have been here in the U.S. for a while. Um, we look to the Chinese family associations, or what we call the Chinese benevolent societies, right? right. They were started in the 1800s, um, mostly so that they can... Uh, send the bodies, you know, when they pass away back to the home country, that's how they were started. That was their purpose. But over the years, um, these um, family associations became the protectors, right, of the folks that were here in the U.S., provide a lot of, um, um, I would say, you know, social services as well. Um, and then eventually became pretty influential in the U.S. politics scene as well, especially in the local city and in, in um, regional kind of politics. But we've seen over the years, especially during the dot-com days, so instead of the family associations, we've seen this growth of professional associations. Mm -hmm. So groups like Monty Jade, which is the Taiwanese Engineering Association, and they support projects in the U.S. and also in Taiwan. So making sure scholarships, educational programs are there. Um, and then we've also seen this kind of move from the professional associations into the arts and cultural groups, right? That bonded and make sure um, our language and our culture and our food <laughs> are continued. Um, so it, I think it's re really interesting to see all these phases. And now we see all these global companies like Meta and Google with employee associations. Um, we call them ERGs, employee resource mm -hmm. groups, and they're global groups. Groups, okay? So for example, there's a Vietnamese group, American group here in the US, but then there's a group in Vietnam and they connect and they talk to each other. So it's not just for the business side of it, but also the relationship and the networking piece. So lots of opportunities, I think, to figure out how to get engaged in, in the diaspora community and also meeting others and networking. Before I have you stop, uh, um, close on that, can you just at, help us understand how Give to Asia fits into that mix in terms of facilitating that? Sure, sure. So uh, so, familiar? Yeah, so with Give to, and it's really interesting because I was a chief philanthropy officer for Give to Asia. So I actually did the fundraising. <clears throat> when we would look um, to find donors, the diaspora donors, I would go and attend a lot of these conferences and events. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing, the executives and founders and startup entrepreneurs, and most of immigrants are entrepreneurs, you know, when during, especially during the dot-com days. Um, and they were really interested in giving back to their homeland, but then also giving here in the U.S. because now their families are here. Um, and what's fascinating is, yes, we could talk about kind of the everyday giving dollar amounts, but once you get to that level of being an executive or entrepreneur, you're talking about lots of planning needs, right? And the charitable, U.S. charitable tax deduction is kind of the key to that planning. Um, and so we want to take advantage of that as well. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. And Heba, we'll go to you now, please. Okay, um, I had maybe different uh, experience. Since I started uh, Marcel nine years ago, I depended all the time on social media in Egypt. And then I transferred this experience outside. Um, and now I have about half a million uh, followers in different applications. Um, and this was our way to, in Egypt, Inside, then outside, many people and um, know heard about Marcel about our cases. So many times I publish different cases with emotional details. I publish our projects and our vision for the future, and um, all the, of the donors start to um, follow Marcel as their babies, and they see how how it get bigger and better every day and now all our fund and king bid one through social media mm -hmm. uh, and at the, the last year 2022 uh, I just started to travel for USA and Europe and meet Egyptian people and right. make uh, events gathering and talk to them and live about Marcel and our uh, projects for the future but um, most of them depend on social media. Right. Now, I mean, half a million, that's incredible uh, followers. And I love the fact that you've leveraged digital channels to be able to engage those communities. What role has KBF US played in that? Because I know that you're a KBF US partner. Okay. Um, in Egypt, we have 
some complicated policies to receive money from outside. So King Bidwin was uh, the best way for us to uh, facilitate facilitate getting uh, um, the donations yep. and at the same time keep uh, in connection, very connection with our donors. Right, absolutely. No, I love that. Thank you very much for sharing that. And Martin, now let's speak about you. You've been working with a lot of different, uh, I mean, I know Irish is where you started, but you work in a lot of different, uh, with a lot of diaspora communities. Can you share some insights from your experience? Yeah, look, I, I think to kind of unpack what Deanne and Heather said, kind of, you know, just the, the harsh mm -hmm. reality that almost the harsh reality of diaspora engagement to get the philanthropic engagement. You know, when people say we want to engage a diaspora for philanthropic purpose, I often say which diaspora? Right. <laughs> because, you know, if you're talking about your executive diaspora that's in the C-suite, they might be fundamentally different to, you know, people that are in terms of giving up remittances, for example. So I think yeah. there's, there's a composition and a complexity there that needs to be unpacked. And I think what's the good advantage of the, the tax system in the US is that it's, it's set up to be quite attractive to get involved in this in this landscape. So I think the first question you have to answer is who are they, where are they, and what are they doing? And, and, that, and that takes a bit of time, you know, in the sense of really unpacking that. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, even back to the end's experience and Heber's experience, maybe the new generation will, will pop up in different landscapes than maybe the older generation will pop up and, and maybe in different types of organizations as well. And I think it's, it's mm -hmm. important to understand Particularly, you know, coming back to the question, if you're starting out from the beginning is, you know, what type of organizations are already out there that can give you the pathway to some of these compositions as well, you know, and I shouldn't say this as an academic. So if people don't quote me on this, if we get out, you know, but I, I'm a big believer in CASE, which stands for copy and steal everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I think that's what the, the Irish diaspora did back in the 70s. They began to look, for example, at the time what the Jewish community were yes. doing in terms of, and, and really began to unpack that and say, you know, if the system exists, can we build something similar for Ireland? No, don't get me wrong. The cultural context would be different, for example. But I think that that you know that's always a good place to begin. But I think that nuance is important that the end mentioned. I think it, it really is important to really understand the different complexities of of your diaspora, the different stages of life, the different backgrounds. And, and one of the things that we've learned from working with diasporas around the world is that you know diasporas don't necessarily give the service our needs; they give the service their needs. And, right. you know, it's, it's important to really understand how you bring them on that journey and that educational piece as well, because quite often, I think we kind of assume just because of the big numbers in the sector around remittances that diasporas are out there waiting to give. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a lot tougher than that. You know, as we say, a, a bad day on the road beats a good day in the office when you're, when you're out working in diaspora philanthropy. So I think, you know, really understanding what makes the diaspora tick as well is, is what's critically important, particularly at an individual level. So I'll pause yeah. there just to kind of keep it going. I want to ask you, can you can you unpack a little bit about what you said about uh, they give to for their needs? Can you just explain that a little bit for people who may not be familiar with that? Yeah, of course. So look, I, I, look, I, give, I think the end gave a great example of it. You'll have certain members of the diaspora that will be fundamentally interested in culture or the arts or the pre preservation of history or cultural memory, you know, but you may also have people that are really passionate about the health sector and the work that, yeah. that Heather does. And I think what the role of a lot of great organizations like the, the folks on this call is that, you know, once you understand what the diaspora wants and needs and they're giving, then it's about the brokerage, you right. know, because because quite often what we hear from diasporas again and again is that we get asked a lot. <laughs> you know, yeah. one of my favorite lines, and it's difficult to draw big generalizations about diaspora engagement, but the one sentence I've heard from nearly every diaspora I've worked with, and we've worked in about I think it's about 30 or 40 countries now, is that most diasporas feel like an ATM. Yes. <laughs> you know, in the sense of, you know, maybe family. I can relate. Family, you know, so, so, so I think if you, if you can go with a proposition that service their needs, you know, I think it's, it's quite a compelling one. And I think for me, diaspora philanthropy, particularly for diaspora communities, is also a pathway to power. I, I think we don't talk about, about that enough. And I think Deanne hinted at that as well in terms of, the political landscape and I think that's where we will build sustainability for the great diaspora organizations that are in the U.S. and different countries of destination as well so we should never be afraid of, of talking about the power of this as well. Okay all right well I'm going to hold you here for a second because I'm going to ask you the next question Martin. Uh, we're going to now jump in a little bit into best practices um, in diaspora philanthropy and so what tactics uh, differ? Uh, do, do, do different organizations working different fields? So, like you said, it, you know, universities, cultural institutions versus grassroots orgs. Like, what are what kind of tactics would we have to really think about for smaller organizations, which are kind of the the great number of people, a great number of organizations on this call in terms of how they might want to go 
about doing this? Yeah, look, just just to kind of kick it off, I think Heba's story is, is phenomenally impactful in that, in a sense of, you know, the first question is, how do you build visibility and awareness? How do you people know that you exist right. <laughs> as an organization and, and, and kind of bringing it out? And I think there's certain rooms that I think traditionally we, we, we do a lot of work in diaspora engagement in silos. You know, you'd have a lot of great nonprofits out there doing some really fascinating stuff. You'd have, you know, academic institutions, as you mentioned. You know, but I think connecting the dots in that, and for me, I think the future of those connections and visibility is, is through more transparent diplomacy and really mob mobilizing the diplomatic missions as well to grab this and, and run with it. Because if you do it well enough, it can help government as well in terms of philanthropy. One, one of the great lessons that we had in Ireland, for example, it's, it's a line that stuck with me from my PhD research that somebody that ran a, uh, ran a very large philanthropic foundation and the, the sentence was just remember that private philanthropy is private it can go to places where governments cannot or do not want to go you know and if you think I think that should be a very compelling message to governments <laughs> given some of the geopolitical crises we're facing in the world so I think yeah. I asked where philanthropy can play a role in, in, in that lens as well so so I think you know it, it is about you know those those elements of building awareness and building the right connections and partnerships but I guess my nervousness for a lot of maybe diaspora organizations out there globally as well is that they do get into, you know, what I would call traditional donor dependency modeling and, and, and the challenge is, you know, how do you break through? And I think sometimes the ask to diaspora philanthropist, I think, is a little bit off skew in a sense of I think the greatest investment they can make is to invest in diaspora organizations right. <laughs> and, and allow them to prosper and allow them to, to excel because that's where you will build the sustainability and you can build then the viability to work directly with your local partners in your country of origin. So I think there's there's different there's different asks along the journey, I guess, is the message I'm trying to get across, but there's a couple of fundamentals around visibility, having a clear case statement, you know, making sure people across the organization are on point in it. But, but that's kind of where I think we need to get to eventually in diaspora engagement in terms of a different, a different philanthropic aspect. <laughs> right, exactly. And I mean, something you mentioned that, that I think is important for us to remember is they're donors like any other donors. So you have to do the research. You need to understand their priorities in the same way that you would with a, other, you know, other types of donors. So really taking that into consideration and knowing that their needs are very important and then creating a case for support that aligns with whatever it is that, that they're they're looking to um, engage with. So I, I agree with you 100%. I'm going to now open it up to Dan to, um, to answer that question, please. No, I, just to follow up on both of what you've said, I think it's really important to understand the donor that you're trying to engage. What because remember, immigration comes in waves, right? So, so you know, like for example, for the, for the Chinese and the Vietnamese and, and like the Cambodians, they came. Some of them came with nothing, right? right. They may have one suitcase, maybe ten bucks in their pocket. But others came, especially now with this new wave. They're coming and they're buying million dollar houses. So I think understanding <laughs> which your donor market right is really really important and mm -hmm. understanding which wave they came in also talks about what issues they're really interested in supporting so you might have the first wave that's really interested in supporting the village back home the temples the churches the religious organizations and then education but now you know their kids or maybe the new wave is looking at things from an entrepreneurship a climate change, a much more holistic global perspective, right? So I think really understanding and unpacking who your donors are, who you would like to be your donors is really important because that determines your market. And then which follows to the conversations you have with them, right? It's these conversations, like Martin said, they're very private and they're very personal, but being able to understand life back home, mm -hmm. life here in the U.S., and then the third piece, which is the transition of both places, right, really affect their perspective on how they want to make a difference mm -hmm. and what they think, you know, that they can change. Um, so I think that's really important as well. And then you follow that up with the tools, right? Are they just giving cash? Are they are we just moving money directly? Are we thinking about much more charitable planning tools like donor advice funds, right? Or creating friends funds for mm -hmm. certain organizations. Um, so I think all those are really important things to think about, who your market is, the donor market, how you're gonna approach them, what kind of conversations are you gonna have, and then what kind of planning tools do they need and what tools do you, your organization need to help facilitate this gift? Absolutely, no, I love that, I, I love that. The tools are very important. Uh, Heba, can we hear from you, please? Uh, yes, I believe that um, 
every organization has uh, its priorities and so how you um, share your case depending uh, on their interest for for example universities and culture ngos care uh, about um, uh, women empowerment about mm -hmm. refugees but others um, in egypt care more about uh, poor patients, especially with uh, high inflation in Egypt. So they just care about emotions and how to support them. But uh, outside Egypt, we focus more on sustainability and mm -hmm. uh, general cases like especially women uh, empowerment. So you have to know how to um, to choose a suitable case for every uh, NGO or, or an institute and make different ways uh, for funding, not only cash, for example, in Mercel. Sometimes so we, we accept medical equipment, uh, medical suppliers every donor has his own way to donate mm -hmm. others help us with the uh, uh, capability building okay. so they um, fund for uh, having a new website or giving courses for our team mm -hmm. yeah that's 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 terrific do you ever have any folks who come and volunteer uh, yes, we have uh, some of them uh, online also, and some mm -hmm. come to our office depending on their available time. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. So now that we've had an opportunity to come cover those couple of questions, I'm now um, going to uh, take a moment to address some of the questions related to our panel discussion from the audience. Um, so folks, please feel free to keep ask, asking your questions, and I'm going to read the ones that were sent to me right now. So this first one is from, I hope I I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Josida Swain, who notes that remittances by African diaspora have o overtaken ODA, but we lack structures to promote diaspora giving. What policies can governments implement to promote diaspora giving? Uh, and notes uh, that they've heard of WAQF embedded uh, in the Egyptian constitution, but are there other examples? So maybe Martin uh, and Heba, you may wanna cover this question. Uh, okay. Can I, sure, can I hear ahead. it again, please? Sure. So Josida Swain notes that African remi that uh, remittances by African diaspora have overtaken ODA, but we lack structures to promote diaspora giving. What policies can governments implement to promote diaspora giving? So that's the first part. And then this person notes that they've they've heard of WAQF embedded in the Egyptian Constitution, but are there other examples? Uh, Are you familiar with WAQF? No, sorry. Okay, so maybe we just can answer the first part, uh, and maybe um, Lindsay, if we can get some further clarification on that second part. But um, so, what can pol what policies can government implement to promote diaspora giving? Okay, um, and easier to have very restricted. Uh, uh, laws regarding donations and mm -hmm. NGOs and what we try to do to communicate with the ministry uh, we, which we are under uh, it's uh, supervised and provide them with uh, different suggestions and solutions and at the same time has different branches out, uh, outside Egypt so we established Marcel USA Mm -hmm. uh, now and having now also uh, Marcel at Germany to mm -hmm. facilitate to have another solutions beside um, negotiation with the ministry to have a better situation. Right, absolutely. Uh, that's great. Um, and Martin, I know you work with a lot of governments. What can you chime in on this? Yeah, look, I, I think having hit, hit the nail in the head, I think part of the question is where the, where's the money going to be raised, right? And right. There's, there's, a, there's a reason why philanthropic giving is, is so prominent in the US, you know, mm -hmm. tax, 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 tax. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. at, at, at a very simple level, if you really want to re reduce it down. So I think uh, coming back to countries of origin, you know, I think there's there, there are certain policy instruments that could be put in place. But I think the first step you need to do is we're seeing, for example, across the continent of Africa, a rise of national governments develop diaspora policies and diaspora strategies. And, and what we're seeing is diaspora philanthropy quite often being skipped in the journey, if you will. 
in a lot of those policies. So I give an example of, of, of what I mean by that. And it comes back to the question in terms of remittances. The reason why this topic is capturing such attention is just the size of remittances. And, yeah. and what, we're, what we're capturing is official remittances. But unofficial remittances that are going through the informal markets were probably close to a trillion dollar industry a year, you know. So, so governments have been really captivated by this jump of remittances to, in, in, remittance to investment. It's been a mantra of the sector for probably the last decade to 15 years. But we're making very little inroads in terms of the infrastructural and sustainable impact in that journey, if we're being frank with ourselves. That's just mm -hmm. the hard reality of, of what we're facing. And I always saw the philanthropic piece as the portal between remittances and, and investment, because what, what when we really break down remittances, you know, they're, they're private capital flows that are, tend to go back to families or community development projects. And quite often the discussion on philanthropy and diaspora discussions oversimplifies the concept a bit. You know, right. and, and what I would say is that remittances are the proof of concept of the culture of giving mm -hmm. in the diaspora. The challenge you have in the next step is how do you shift that culture of giving to a culture of strategic giving, right. which is which is where philanthropic instruments can come into play. And I think mm -hmm. that's where that's where you can build the pathway and the portal into the wider investment discussions that are need to be happening, you know, not just in Africa, but 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 around the world. So I don't know if that answers the question directly or not, but I think, you know, you need to, I think we need to build deeper understanding of what it's about. And I think, you, you, you know, you need to have some, some incentives within diaspora policies or other relevant policy frameworks to make that a reality. And mm -hmm. the good news is I think the countries that move first on this will get the greatest rewards from it. <laughs> so, yes. so, so it'll be interesting to see who takes up that challenge. Absolutely. Um, so we just got some clarification about what WK, WAQF is. Uh, it's an endowment made by a Muslim to a religious, educational, or other charitable cause. Heba, that adds further clarification. Yeah, Liz, maybe I can jump in and help. With okay, that. go for it. I, I teach travel <laughs> tools. Um, so I, I'm, I call myself a technical geek here. Um, <laughs> Think of the WAF as basically, you know, it's, it's an investment, but you can't just be invested in anything. It has to be invested based on share rate law, right? Investment. Right. Um, so it's basically a tool. It could be a charitable trust that holds the endowment. Mm -hmm. And then as it grows, then money is dispersed out. So think of it as a charitable trust or in the U.S. context, like a donor advice fund. Sure. Kind of concept. Um, but this, uh, and I don't know specifically about Egyptian law, but I can say that a lot of governments are really looking into these charitable tools. Mm -hmm. Because charitable tools are, and, and not the charitable deduction that comes along with it, are ways to generate interest, right, and, and, right. and incentivize. And so you are seeing a, a wave of all the governments really trying to understand how these laws work. And they are looking to the U.S., especially our private foundations, our charitable trusts, and our donor advice kind of, kind of mechanisms. Um, in Asia, especially in Singapore, with this surge of like family offices, I mm -hmm. think they went from like 126 to 700, and now it's over 1,000 family offices. The Singapore and all community, like the government, is really focused on the tools. They are trying to promote philanthropy and they have to build the tools to do it. And it, this all makes sense, right? Because if mm -hmm. wealth is growing in your country or through the diaspora, you have to find a way to incentivize and pass these gifts somehow. And so that's why the government is so interested in these tools. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, we have a question from Leo Donaghy uh, about the panel's thoughts on um, older, sort of six, 60 years plus, versus younger, 30 to 55 giving, and their philanthropy potential. So it's, you know, sort of seniors versus youth-ish. <laughs> um, what, what are your thoughts on, I guess, where, where the, the opportunity lies? And I, I know that that's a very broad question, but maybe, um, you know, later I was going to ask a question about sort of Gen Z giving, but what are your thoughts about, um, you know, how one appro would approach an older donor um, versus one who's sort of 30 in their 30s, sort of mid career, mid, mid, mid to late career, mid to early or mid career. You want me to take that uh, one? <laughs> <laughs> hey, but do you want to do it? Do you want to? Yeah, yes, um, and my uh, experience with Rand uh, and Marcel on uh, generations. Okay under 14, and um, most of our uh, donations from them, because we depend on social media, I think it depends on the tool you uh, you use. For example, in Egypt, when you uh, have ads on TV, 
you will get money from all the people, but when you uh, tend to social media, you will get uh, from uh, under 14. So it depends on the tool and the yeah. message you send. I believe all the people always um, depend or uh, tend to emotional message yeah. most of the time, but the new generations talk about sustainability, uh, mm -hmm. uh, new cases, empower uh, women empowerment. So they have their own direction. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and Martin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, just to jump in, actually, Leo's a friend of mine, so it's, it's good, good that he's online. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, I, 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 I think there's a couple of elements to this. You know, the end hinted at something earlier that I think it's important to acknowledge in the diaspora lens. It's not just that the waves of migration are different, but the diasporic journey is different. You know, and I think as people get later in life, they begin to ask themselves maybe different questions. Yep. In the, in the sense of, you know, where am I from? What's my legacy? You know, and I think just in terms of, to pick up on that intergenerational piece, obviously a topic that's been capturing a lot of attention in the sector is the intergenerational transfer of wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that just tells you that the private wealth in the in the world is in the hands of people over the age of sixty. Right. So I, I remember, and it, it's linked to an earlier question you asked Liz about, you know, some of the tips and the models. When people say to me, "What's the best model of diaspora fundraising out there?" The the the, the, the title doesn't have the word diaspora in the title. Right. <laughs> I, I call it the US Ivy League alumni engagement model. Right. And, you're engaging the masses for a relatively modest amount, but you're also engaging those significant game, ch game changers in your community for quite transformative amounts. So that's what Chuck Feeney did for Ireland, for example. And right. we, we say every organization and every country have to has to find their Chuck Feeney. And mm -hmm. particularly in the diaspora, here's the good news. They exist, <laughs> you know, but, yes. but, but, are, but are they going to pop up in your cultural associations? associations? Maybe not. You know, they might be a bit more quiet, a bit more private. So I, I think with that intergenerational lens, I think it's a reality. You know, the, the numbers are mind blowing on it. You know, right. I think the, even the most modest estimations that from the earliest reports from Accenture was around 30 to, 30 to 33 trillion going to be transferred wow. generationally, you know, by 2050, mm -hmm. which, is, which is not that long away. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and so I think that piece is important to unpack as well, because as I say, with a diaspora hat on, when people get to a certain stage of life, they do begin to ask them different to themselves different questions, you know, particularly in the sense of where do I belong and where's my legacy going to be? And, you know, organizations back in the country of origin should, should be should be awake to that and should be working on it now, to be frank. <laughs> to push yeah, I, right, exactly. The time is now. <laughs> to work on that, right? To to get ready for that, uh, and I would imagine, uh, Tian, you may have a perspective on this as well. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. I, I, are we talking about third the thirty year old who is mm -hmm. the founder, the the entrepreneur, the money maker, right? So it's very right. different versus inheriting. If you are a second generation or first generation inheritor of right. the family that came, so I think. That needs to be distinguished. Um, but in general, I would say the 60 year old and up are very much interested in like, we want to make money here in the US yeah. or wherever we are and send it home. Mm -hmm. I find the 30, 40 year old are much more interested in like, let's go there and let's see what we could build there. Let's right. let's help them build, right? Yeah. So I think the perspective is a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. but they might actually want to create a company, a global company to really build jobs and economic livelihood versus let's go fund an NGO to do that work. Um, right. Very different perspectives on how they want to practice philanthropy. Yeah, I hear you. Um, okay, let's, let's go into, thank you for that. Let's go into Jim. Jerwix is interested in how payments are processed in Africa. Okay, broad, but okay. Uh, because there are so many payment systems that vary by country. And what is the impact of digital currency, if any? Um, so just to kind of jump in quickly on this, I would imagine that given the kind of the context of this conversation, uh, we would say that you know quite a number, significant percentage of giving to let's say the African continent is actually through intermediaries like a, a KBF US. It's not like they're necessarily giving on a payment platform um, on on the continent itself. So um, I don't know. I think that 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 is kind of the, the majority of the way that the funds are going to flow through is from an intermediary here in the US to to facilitate the giving to an organization on the continent but does anybody have any any thoughts on the 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 you know the impact of digital currency and sort of what you know how people are dealing with with uh, 
the challenges related to payment systems on the you know on, on the continent. Martin, may you have an um, yeah? Look, I, like I, I think I think more broadly that has been more around the private sector development, you know, yeah. and the banking sector, particularly in the payment sector in Africa. I think on the philanthropic lens, we're still maybe a step away from that. But I think you know, coming back with the generational lens in mind. Simple reality nowadays, you know, young kids coming through there to spend their lives on screens, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and 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 the way they operate and, and the way they will operate financially will have to be responsive to that. So I think you know, linking it back to those tools that the end was talking about earlier, that you know, the, the governments are looking at, and different actors around the, the sector in Africa will be looking at digital will have to be a key part of the offering, in a sense of of how they they engage, you know, particularly you know generations that will come. In terms of their financial yeah, contributions. Absolutely. Um hundred percent agree with you on that. Um I think that's wonderful. Anyone want to add anything or should we go? We will have a second uh, round of open QA, but I want to ask a question now that I had I prepared if we can if you in, will indulge me. Um and this is really related to strengthening diaspora philanthropy networks. Um so how do you keep your diaspora donors engaged in the long term, right? Because it's like it's not about getting the one-off donation um, or one-off engagement. It's really trying to think about how do you keep them engaged long-term, especially while navigating the geo distance, the geographic distance. Um, Heba, maybe you may want to tell us a little bit about that and then we'll go to Dan and then Martin. Okay, as I mentioned, um, I developed in social media and um, mm -hmm. it makes everything easier because we all the time we post our new projects, our even our our problems, and even it is um, uh, there are bad news and or we like our funds. We always publish our news, and mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, in different platforms, not only one. Some countries, for example, prefer uh, uh, TikTok or Snapchat. Others prefer uh, <laughs> others prefer in Egypt. Facebook is the best. Uh, is a more, a more popular. We, so I I post on dof different uh, platforms, and at the same time, we send them a newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, monthly, yearly, with our uh, cases, our new projects, uh, our achievements, and mm -hmm. our challenges, and this make uh, 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 make the communication easier. And at the same time, we be, uh, we launched projects specifically for people outside Egypt okay. to help them communicate with their families. So. Uh, many of them ca call us every month because we take care for their families and provide medical services for their families in Egypt. Right. Okay. That's that's wonderful. Um, can I ask you, just out of curiosity, you mentioned Facebook as being a very important platform, and then you um, TikTok, and and you talked about um, Snapchat, and of course email. Have you done anything with maybe WhatsApp with WhatsApp's functionality around yes. like lists and stuff? Because I think that's a very important platform. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, two groups uh, on WhatsApp because it has limits for the number. Right. So. Uh, and everywhere we have a profile a account or a group or or whatever depending on the platform so they can follow up the news and know what are available and send emails because some of them don't follow any of the social media right right so it's just another platform that they're already using that can give you real time accessibility to them right if you have an emergency appeal or something like that Yes, and okay. some the uh, but sorry, no, so no, I no. call some of them. I call them uh, VIB donors or uh, the most important donors. I keep in contact with them personally, yes. even saying hi, uh, happy Christmas or whatever, just to keep in contact. Okay, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, uh, Dan, would you like to share something on that? terms of uh, long-term uh, engagement? I, I would, and this is a horrible thing to say, but disasters <laughs> engage diaspora donors, right? Anytime mm -hmm. there's a disaster in the home country, yeah. the diaspora, they will come together and they will support. Um, and, and it's instant and immediate, right? Because it's very emotional and heart-tugging. Mm -hmm. uh, for Give to Asia, you know, we, we have always had a, an issue of try, 
there's so many disasters that happen in Asia. We can even kind of predict in a way, right, when they, they will happen. Um, so being prepared is really important. And so Gift Asia pulled together this disaster link network of pulling all the organizations that work in certain countries that can respond quickly to disasters. Um, and I think promoting that you know, to the donors, right, and reaching right. out to this, but making sure that like, they're ready, something happens, there is a platform to immediately respond. I think that's really important. Um, Years ago, when I was working at Gift Asia, we had the China earthquake, and then we had the, you know, there was a big cyclone in Burma. A year later, I would always try and take some of the major donors to go visit. Um, and we always say it's a year later, because then you could actually see, right, right. some of the impact that's happening. Um, and that engagement is really, really important. It is mm -hmm. a lot of work to do donor trips, but it's very, very important to get them engaged because they can see the impact. Um, mm -hmm. Even though they might be the diaspora donor that goes back to the home country every single year to mm -hmm. visit, it's still important, I think, to do that work for, for them to see that progress. So uh, disasters might be horrible, but they're a great way to engage your donors. Um, another one I want to give an example is universities. Like Martin was saying, universities are amazing. I used to um, work with a group called IIT, Bombay Heritage Fund. The mm -hmm. IITs, right, are amazing. They're the cream of the crop engineers. Okay. If you can't get into Yale or Harvard, go yeah. to an IIT. Like, that, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's how it is. Um, they, so so what happened was when IIT was started, um, they brought in like the 2025 20, major alumni like that were founders of companies and big names like Victor Manessis at Citibank. And they put them together in a living room. And, you know, Victor stood up and said, I'm going to give this amount. Right. It went around the circle in less than 20 minutes, $20 million. Yeah. That I, I think keeping the, the figuring how to engage, but it's all about relationships and connecting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is really key. <clears throat> so I think, you know, there was a question about how do you do seat finding seat funding and finding donors, find the connections, find the relationships, right? right. And you will find your group of donors. I agree, which is not any different from any other fundraising, right? Or any other kinds of donors, right? They just, we just adding the term diaspora, like, you know, but it's literally understanding that these are people and you need to figure out how to build those relationships and who the influences are and what's going to move the, the needle for them. And but, pride, right? Yeah, and pride, of course. It's pride yeah. in, in your course. country, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And I've just, you mentioned disasters are being really important. Um, kind of catalyst. And I think that for folks, uh, for, for the folks who are um, managing the chat, if you can drop a link to the webinar we did last month on giving during crises, um, I think it would be helpful for those who may have missed it, because there were really great insights shared there so that, you know, people can capitalize on that as well. Um, Martin, would you like to add to this? Yeah, look, I, I'm going to predominantly echo what was said previously. Look, one of the things we've learned from working with diasporas around the world philanthropically is that the first gift is never the, the largest. Right. You know, so so what they're also beginning to figure out is, you know, that issue of trust and stewardship, you know, and, and I, I think that stewardship nowadays with the tools we have at our disposal can be high tech and high touch. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think you're absolutely spot on at the end as well. I think, you know, it's it's important to have those people that will at the beginning put their hand up, you know, and and you have to be, really understand, you know, how you're running your campaign and what you're trying to raise here and, and the capacity of different people within your diaspora to do different things. Right. And, and that's, that's the science of it, you know, in the sense of, of kind of building out that process. So, it, you know, we say the old, is it 80, 20 rule of business goes out the window on diaspora fundraising? It's 99 one. And that's the different type of engagement in terms of the upper level. Of course, you can do the mass community engagement pieces, you know, for right. relatively modest amounts. But I think, you know, that stewardship is peace. You know, a lot of organizations, sometimes just because of capacity, feel like it's a burden and there's too much work to do. But mm -hmm. that's how you, that's that, that's how you shift the first step and the first gift into something much more sizable and impactful moving forward. So I just wanted to bring that up in, in the context of this conversation. Okay, okay, that's great. I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll open it back up to the Q and A because my my you should see the text coming in from uh, with questions for me. But I want to definitely cover this area, which is really building sustainable uh, di diaspora philanthropic efforts. And so the question is, what diaspora giving trends can we learn from in the past few years? And we've had quite a an interesting past few years uh, that we might be able to capitalize on uh, moving forward. Um, and Martin, I think, are you still, no, okay, maybe if, if uh, you want to pick that up and then we'll go to Deanna and then Heba. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, the the trends that, that that I would look at, you know, 
maybe a lack of a trend of is another way of coming back to maybe something that I tried to unpack a bit earlier mm-hmm. is I, I, I really believe one of the more strategic philanthropic investments we can make in diaspora engagement at large is in the well-being and the sustainability of the sector. Yeah. But when, when you go to a lot of, of you know, really world-class events, don't get me wrong, there, you, know, you see a lot of great organizations, philanthropic organizations around it. You know, the one thing I often ask myself, if we, if we got rid of those logos off the sponsorship page, would we still be here? Right? Yeah. And, and, and I, think, I think that's a big challenge for the sector moving forward. So, I, you know, one of the things that working with diasporas around, and this, this is a trend, you know, coming back to that issue of pride, Deanne, I think it's, it's, you know, pride in the community of where they are as well and the story of their own success and their own impact. You know, and that's something that we saw quite visibly in Ireland, you know, a hundred years ago in the US, there was there were signs in the front door of more shops saying the Irish weren't welcome. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's not that that's not that long ago when, when, you, when you take the historical look at it. So I think that pride, I think another trend to look out for within diaspora philanthropy is that whilst pride in the nation is important, some people are more passionate about a place within the nation. So, for mm-hmm. example, their, their hometown, their their community, you know, and, and really investing there. And that's where to begin with them in terms right. of engaging with, 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 with diaspora kind of contributors. And I think we're seeing that rise up more and more in a lot of discussion around the role of diaspora giving and local development or rural development and, and linked to the issues of climate impact and, and crises that we talk about and disasters quite often. It's those communities that feel it most. So I think, you know, you can connect the dots there as well when, when the, the context allows. So I'll, I'll pause there to let other people come in, but, but the other things that I look at, and obviously the intergenerational piece that I mentioned earlier, I think we all have to keep, as a trend, we all have to keep an eye on that. No, I agree with you. And Dan, I just want to add a, 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 a little bit of a, a another twist to this question, because I think you really well placed to answer this question. What, you know, when we think about diaspora giving, someone like me, let's say, who lives here, but I may be interested in giving Uganda, I don't necessarily know which organizations, other other than like me giving to someone in my family, I don't necessarily know which organizations may be, really, may be first of all, legitimate and the ones that I that may um, uh, fit my interests. What role does a KBF US or Give to Asia play in facilitating that uh, discovery? Because I think it's also important for us to think about. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so I'll put in two hats here. One is okay. like the advisor that yes. works with families and helping them figure out which organizations and how to give, right? Mm-hmm. Um, for, for, and then from the Give to Asia hat, we have a list. Check out our list, right? right. Very easy, simple. Go, go, go to the organizations, KBF or Give to Asia, look at the list of organizations working in those countries. Um, organizations are very easy to find. That's not the problem. The problem is trust and impact, right? Uh, th- that is key. Um, so as a philanthropy advisor, one of the things that we're in charge of doing is actually, to, one is looking at the landscape map. If you mm-hmm. are interested in saying mental health, right, in, in like early childhood education, um, how that's incorporated, well, it's hard to get that from a list, right? So what you do is um, we start looking at other organizations working in that area. We surface some of the organizations and then we share this with our donor clients, right? Mm-hmm. They do. Um, and then the next step is really looking at uh, which organizations can we make a gift to you? So passing the donor due, due diligence work, right, has to be done, looking at the organizations itself, and then looking at the organization's impact. Um, but the final piece is figuring out which pot of the money that the family has to make that gift. And right. surprisingly, that is the hardest type of work, especially with high net worth and ultra high net worth families, because mm-hmm. we want to maximize tax deduction, but we also want to make sure that, you know, in terms of which, you know, is it coming from the trust? Is it coming from this pot of money that's sitting in the U.S. or this pot of money that's sitting in Uganda? Right, right. right. Yes, yes. But, which yes. is very different. Yeah. Yes. Which goes back to the original question is donors are getting very, very savvy. Mm-hmm. And organizations, NGOs on the ground, you need to step up and be just as savvy and learning the tax issues, the charitable planning issues. Like, what are your donors facing, right? Because they will ask you that question. Um, and then I also want to just really push up the idea of networks are being built, mm-hmm. which is amazing. So, so for example, you know, networks in the sense that they're learning so much in like the U.S. and how donor engagement networks are being formed here. They will take this concept back to the home country and they will form networks. And now mm-hmm. you've got a bridge of bringing the diaspora donors back in. And now you're trying to grow homegrown philanthropy networks. 
Yeah. That to me is the most beautiful part, right? Of all this. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been involved with those. So I absolutely agree with you on that, right? And then the, then you have scale yes. uh, when you do that. So that's wonderful. And then Heba, we'll hear from you in terms of trends. Um, and then we'll we'll go ahead and open up to the millions of questions that are here in my, that have been texted to me <laughs> for all of you. Okay. Um, I believe we have uh, to be updated with uh, events. And um, uh, for example, now all our donors focus on Gaza and what to be sent for them. Before that, it was Sudan. So to be updated with the new cases and help more people. Also, um, be uh, out uh, Egyptian, Egyptian outside Egypt, um, depend on the word of mouth about the NGOs in Egypt. If they really help or not, if their credibility or not. So focusing on the message that uh, that happened in Egypt first, then it will be transferred outside, mm -hmm. and have new creative uh, creative ideas to connect them to their families. For example, in Mother Day, uh, we had a project to send f flowers and instead for them for their mothers. Okay. Without any donations. Oh, wow. And this was very emotional. And I love that. Are re related to the foundation. We didn't take any money, just send the flowers. Now we have the project of uh, uh, providing healthcare monthly health care for their parents in Egypt because they uh, uh, they think about them and don't know what if they had have emergency or something like this. So we inform them, we will take care of them uh, if there are any emergency. We send monthly doctor for their families. I think the fundraisers should have new ideas to keep uh, the, the communications beside emails and social media to give them services for free. Right. Okay. No, I think that's really great. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So I have a lot of questions. So I think we're, the way we're going to do this is if you definitely feel that this is something you want, a particular question comes up, you feel you um, want to answer it. That's great. If not, we'll be able to jump to, to the next one. If, if, and, and so maybe one or two may answer that question. So let's go ahead and um, let's read this one. This is Akul Sharma asks, with donors and other stakeholders, is there some type of matrix or model template that you incorporate to support better understanding of each unique donor and uh, donor persona? Uh, I think that's really, that sounds like uh, either you probably, um, Dian, um, who probably is best place to answer that. Uh, I wish there was one, but I think it's <laughs> difficult to pull together. I think, yeah. And the reason is because it's based on country. Uh, yes. Based on the different various countries, and again, based on timeline, the way mm -hmm. you've come in, um, and then also based on the wealth, right? Did you come again with a dollar, or did you come with a bill by a million dollar house? Um, so I think personas are different from the demographics. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, there's nothing like that out there. I think there's a way to look at personas from a values perspective, right? I think that might be much more interesting, um, but. If you want to create one, let me know. Let's together. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, and your information is available to them, and they, it's everything's been shared in the chat. So definitely reach out and get get in touch with her. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to a question for you, Martin. This is from Emma Gamani, who says, um, um, "If if you've been able to work with diaspora from East Africa, especially Malawi, where she's from." They're a country that really needs to upskill in terms of diaspora engagement and would love to be involved in transformational activity and networking with associations available in the U.S. and elsewhere from Malawi. So I suppose maybe she's looking for who, what are the organizations, I guess, which diaspora organizations are working? Is that what, maybe that's what the question is. Do you, Martin, do you have anything to add? To, do, yeah, do look, add? one of my favorite roads in the world is, is from the long way to Blantyre. In, yeah. in Malawi, you know, so it's uh, so look, I know Malawi well. We have some some good friends there. Uh, we we early days we were involved in some diaspora work there, but you know, I think just in terms of my, my reflections, I guess on where we're going and th directly to the question, at that time it, it, may, it may have been changed. I think the the key entry point would have been diaspora associations and really mobilizing the government to take it more seriously at the governmental level, diplomatically, right. to engage, and I think that opens the door for conversations. 
you know, for different stakeholders uh, in, in Malawi to engage with, with, um, with, with the diaspora. But I, I want to introduce an interesting concept here because, for example, we also have other non-Malawian philanthropic friends that are involved in Malawi on various projects, and, and we call them affinity diaspora. And, and, and I think like friends. Today, exactly. Like friends. And I, th I think in today's world, you know, we're, we're kind of hinting at it, I think, our conversations. And you know, Diane mentioned it as well. I think, look, I'm a big believer that in, in today's world, you know, to make the world a bit better, geography has to be history. I'm not a big yes. fan of it. I, I say migration is the language of borders, but diaspora is the language of belonging. And you don't have to be from somewhere to belong there. That's <laughs> a great one. You yeah. know, ironically enough. So look, I, I think there's other ways in which you, that's what we tried to do. The reason I'm bringing it up here, that's one of the concepts we tried to bring in in Malawi as well, in a sense of, you know, how do we actually engage these different actors as well? Because I think what's interesting, particularly from country or government perspectives, or even just the societies at large, particularly in different parts of Africa, we're still at the early steps of really mm -hmm. what I would call building the architecture of right. diaspora engagement. You know, and I think, you know, you, what you want to do philanthropically is have strategic wins along that journey. But, mm -hmm. you know, so, so you need to have the government partners, the local nonprofits, the diaspora nonprofits around that architecture. But it's similar to the end point about the, the matrix, I don't think it's been built yet yeah. <laughs> in, in, in many countries, but I think we'll get there. That's the exciting piece when it comes to the diaspora engagement. I just I want to link something that I think the end said earlier about the networks that are being built. And yes. this comes back to the tools that we have. I think one of the great underdeveloped assets that we have in diaspora philanthropy is the role of diasporas in philanthropy mm -hmm. not necessarily you know diaspora philanthropy executive leaders within the philanthropic landscape that have a diaspora component i think the more we connect them and, and kind of unleash them moving forward i think it could bring some really fascinating things to to the sector and that that would include the irish the african you know the asian the north american or the north african so that's not again that's not a that, that's maybe a borderless call to action <laughs> mm -hmm. i love that um i did so i just since we're on that topic can you share a little bit with us what what folks can experience when they when we talk about the global diaspora insights that you founded what 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 are the resources that are available because i think that's that's also important for us to know about what resources people can tap into yeah, so look, as I said earlier, a lot, a lot of our traditional work has been particularly around working with government and, and private sector. And I see some of the other questions that maybe we'll come to later as well in the chat around skills. You know, that's another big area around the, the three T's of diaspora philanthropy. It's not just about money. It's about time, talent and treasure. And mm -hmm. quite often the time and the talent can be more treasurable than the, <laughs> that, that, than the treasure, to be honest. So mm -hmm. look, what, what we do is basically go in and help kind of, you know, teach and train on this, but develop the policies, the strategies and the different tools to drive this forward. And where it came from is, you know, the work that I do with a colleague of mine at the Networking Institute. That's why I was keen to jump up on the networking stuff that was set up by a chap who ran a very successful Irish diaspora philanthropic foundation out of Boston for 20 odd years, mm -hmm. uh, Kingsley Aikens. I think he raised a quarter of a billion from the Irish diaspora. So we like, to bring, we, we like to bring that blend of, you know, a little bit academic if we need it, but more hands on and applied when, when the time is right. So, so that's what you get at GDI. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah, because Rogelio Marchetti is asking, what tools do you use to learn about diaspora interest questionnaires, internet polling? Um, I mean, I think that there, it's a combination, right? Again, it's not any different from any other donors. Yeah, no. And look, I, I mean, the, the, the challenge we have in diaspora engagement is that you have a lot of big organizations out there, even at the UN level, that are doing yes. a lot of work in this area. You know, So, for example, the IOM have a diaspora mapping toolkit. Mm -hmm. The question would be, how do you adapt that? To the philanthropic marketplace that you're looking for and i think you know Deanne and, and heba mentioned that i think under underpinning all this is having a real clarity of vision and mission of where you're going yes. you know because diaspora is a big you know and you can find yourself going down the rabbit hole of, of you know engaging people for across different landscapes but having that clarity of, of purpose you know i think helps you to kind of really begin at a, at a research stage you know who are we engaging with and why you know and i think by adopting that time, talent, and treasure piece, you know, is you bring the engagement then on a journey, you know, and, and the key skill in this is, you know, you would have heard me say this a thousand times, the key mm -hmm. skill in diaspora engagement is listening. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you listen enough, donors or diaspora communities will tell you what they want to do, you know, um, and then and sometimes we don't listen enough in this world. And on that note, I'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, I think this is a good question for you from Maya Aguil Agu Aguilias. Uh, related to non-monetary donations, but let's see. She's a member of the Greek-Australian diaspora who reverse migrated. 
Uh, at one point, the Greek government was interested in har harnessing Greek diaspora skills and building the country back after financial crisis. How could governments and corporations create avenues to share knowledge and know-how from individuals as a form of philanthropy? And could this also extend to corporate ESG? Because you mentioned ESG a little bit, so I wanted you, I thought maybe you could chime in here. Yeah, I, I, you know, all those are so interrelated. Um, you know, you, you can't do this work without the public-private partnerships, right? Yes. On the ground, same as on the donor side. Um, one person cannot do all this work. So I think it's really important to be able to bring the corporates, the government, and also the private sector, mostly individual donors and family yes. donors, right, together. Um, and each one plays a really unique role. You need a champion, right? And usually that champion, a group of champions, are is that individual or group of individual diaspora donors. Mm -hmm. They, If they step up and they have the relationships to the government, they can move like big money <laughs> into the yeah. country, but also skill sets. Because most of the time, these individuals are very accomplished individuals, right? Oh, yeah. Networks, they have the skill sets, they have the companies behind them. And then this brings in the NGO sector as well. Somebody actually has to implement. Um, but and so I think it's all three. The ERG groups, the employee engagement groups are so key. They are on the ground. They know they can recommend organizations and move it up to the company, right? Especially mm -hmm. the foundation side of things. Um, and, and we see that a lot of multinational companies like mm -hmm. J&J &J and others, like working in on the ground, they let them the employees decide which groups yes. they want to support. Absolutely. Right? It's not top yeah. down, it's actually bottom up approach. So get engaged with your local ERGs, right? That's really, really important. Um and Liz, if I can follow up with what Martin was saying, we teach six T's. We don't talk about three T's, we do six T's. So mm -hmm. you have your time, talent, treasure, which Martin yeah. mentioned, ties, testimony, and truth. Ties Love and that. testimony. It's all about diaspora philanthropy and the way we approach BIPOC philanthropy, right? Mm -hmm. Ties and testimonies are so much more important than your treasure. Yeah. Relationships. Like if you make an introduction to somebody say, in the Japanese culture, you stand behind that introduction, yeah. right? Um, and you, you cannot do okay. this work without the ties, especially, again, back to the pride, the connection piece, right? Mm -hmm. And the truth is really important is, how authentic are your relationships, all this work, how are you pulling it all together to match the values that you have? Right. That piece, again, goes back to the listening that Martin was talking about. You need to have these philanthropic individual conversations with your donors. Yes. You can't, we could do polls and research and we can get a general idea of what they want. But if you truly want to work with that individual family, listen to them, talk to them, ask them. Right. Um, and I think what's really missing is the research in the space. Yes. A lot of research about diaspora giving in form of government, the government kind of perspectives. We do not have enough research on sitting down with the donors and the families and saying, why did you give? What did you give to you? How, like, what was the impact? Who helped you with this gift? What tool did you use? We don't have any of that. Very, very little, especially with the ultra high net worth families. So. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree 100% with you on that. And um, thank you for answering it. Um, Heba, I'm going to ask you this question. This is from George Karanja. When approaching individuals, organizations, and companies, what tactics and routes do you use to reach them? Right? That's broad, but, but I think that you, since you're actually working in this directly right now, what are some of the tactics that you've been using and routes? I mean, you talked about how um, in terms of engagement, social media is very important for you. You talked about email, but when you're doing some more of that outreach, what are some of the other uh, ways that you've gone about doing so to engage um, individuals, organizations, and companies? Okay. When I established Marcel, I started to uh, uh, to go for companies and institutes, but they reject all of them because we had no experience. And at the same time, they want to, to deal with well-known organizations. So I stopped looking for them and I worked uh, on individuals and establishing our uh, reputation mm -hmm. in the market for years. Then I started to look for them again Next, uh, another time, but this time with years of working and different projects, 
depending on the case that every uh, company or every institute look for it. Uh, for example, uh, the different embassies, the Swedish uh, embassy this year uh, in Egypt focus on climate change. Mm -hmm. Last year was women empowerment. Mm -hmm. So uh, every time I go for one of them, I prepare a specific project or a specific case related to the vision uh, of this uh, location. Uh, I believe this uh, is the main factor and to have personal relationship with them. Even I, I didn't get uh, even I, I I didn't get the money this year. It will mm -hmm. be better next year. Um, and we uh, attend all the CSR conference in Egypt and events uh, and build uh, uh, the relationship year by year. Uh, regardless, I will get the money this year or not. Right. Yeah, because your relationship building is important, right? And sometimes it takes a long time for that re relationship to um, to materialize into a financial donation. Um, I agree with you on that. Um, hey, Deanne, yes. uh, this six T's, you put, you've lit people on fire. They're like, they want to know more about um you know about the 60s of diaspora philanthropic giving um it, it was it was a general question it wasn't like uh, anything but they want to hear more about this sure uh, and i could drop um a, a short little powerpoint uh, just a um, page around there that describes a little bit about what it is we also have an exercise that we created um mm -hmm. and the idea is you know help sitting down with your donor um, or a board, we actually did this several times with board members um, to engage them, like talk to us, yeah, do this little exercise, evaluate, you know, how you are doing on um, say ties right. on a scale of one to five, where are you at? On testimony, one to five, where are you at? And then what would you like to do more of, less of, or pivot? Um, and the engagement, when you get 10 to 12 people talking about this, it's amazing. Let me just say that once we do this, when they walk out the door, they're amazingly engaged and they're ready to give. <laughs> wow. So so I will share the exercise with everybody, okay. but I encourage you to, to do it. Okay. But when you talk to the donors or the families you're working with, don't start with asking them for money. Ask them. Ask them about, you know, tell us about the ties you still have with the Pakistani community or tell us about the, you know, ties you have with the Afghani community, right? And then right. push on the testimony as well. Like, have you made introductions? Have you right. referred friends? How did you connect the people in your network? Get them talking. It's right. amazing what comes but, out. But Dan, isn't this, this is not different from any other donors that you would deal with, right? If you think no. about it, I mean, it's really... It, Again, yes, they have the tie to the you know to that particular country of origin, but ultimately they're human beings who um, want to do something, want to make a difference a certain way. You just need to understand what that looks like and whether or not that's in alignment. Yes, it's the same process, but I yes. think the most important is just make sure you do the research and understand the country and the culture piece. Um, yes. and, and when I teach advisors, we talk about. I can give you the confidence to do your work and I can even teach you the competence piece. I can give you the skills. What I can't give you, which is really hard, is the cultural agility, right? right. right. To your work. You need right. to do that on your own. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, so 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 now we have a question from Sekoa Kwan Salkin, uh, who works with Conservation Collective, an international network of 20 locally based NGOs funding community-driven environmental projects. Um, and so that's the background to the, the question I'm about to pose. How can environmental organizations best leverage cultural ties and origins within the diaspora to foster stronger connection and inspire support from environmental causes in their country of origin? And I can, that's a long one, but so I can start over. Let me read it again. So um, how can environmental organizations best leverage cultural ties and origins within the diaspora to foster stronger connection and inspire support for environmental causes in their country of origin? I can jump in quickly here, Liz, if it's helpful. Sure, please go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I think what, I think what we're seeing as well is the rise of sector-specific diaspora networks. Yes, that I think are important to you know to to really be be on top of you know so for example and what we're seeing as well within certain landscapes is major international players begin to try and nurture the creation of those networks you know so even on the environmental stuff if we link it more broadly to climate 
the UN Agency for Migration have a pilot project in the UK at the moment, for example, for the Bangladeshi, Ghanaian, Albanian and Jamaican diaspora in the UK around climate action. So environmental issues would fit in there. So I think one of the key lessons is to segment your diaspora as well. And I think traditionally we would have kind of segmented them in a lot of the ways we were talking today in terms of the research step. But I think what we're seeing now is that as confidence of diaspora communities deepen and develop, they're beginning to create their own little niche networks of, of, mm -hmm. of where it's going. So I think that that could be a good way to start in that sense, you know, in the sense of shoot where the interest is, as I say, <laughs> you know, and, and, and begin there. And I just want to come back to something the end said as well, because we I don't think we, we covered it enough, but I think for a lot of particularly smaller organizations as well, the role of the of the board and governance of the organization mm -hmm. is, is critical in a lot of this. You know, yes. if, if you're a smaller organization, you're punch, you're trying to punch above your weight for a while to get going and get a bit of visibility. So I think, you know, really having your board mobilized and on that footing to, to go into battle, if you will, in terms of raising money, making the connections, you know, and as, as the old saying goes, you know, a, a referral beats a cold call every day of the week. You know, so that, that's the way of, of, I think that I just think having that in the back of your mind as well, what tends to happen is that a lot of organizations and particularly diaspora organizations are guilty of this is that you know we get so excited by the mission that yeah. we, forget, we, we forget about the organizational development pieces that that we need to kind of build around the organization to help us actually make sure that diaspora organizations are there by year five year six year seven as nonprofits. so that mm -hmm. i just wanted to kind of amplify that message because i think you know giving can giving can begin with the board and most importantly pathways to giving can begin by the board by, by, by the board sounds good Okay, I've got one anonymous question, which I think both you, Heba, and Dan can answer. How do you, or best place to answer, how do you approach um, soliciting employee resource groups to engage with your cause? Because I know that, Heba, you mentioned that you go to CSR conferences, so that means that you're really looking at that corporate. Uh, and then, um, um, Dan, you mentioned ERGs quite a bit as well. Uh, can you repeat again, please? How, how do you approach soliciting employee resource groups to engage with your cause in a corporation? Okay. Um, in this case, we uh, we go direct to the HR in different companies and institutes and contact them to, to help us by, uh, by two things, connect us to the owner of the company or the board, mm -hmm. and at the same time, uh, allow us to to go to the entity and contact the employees maybe with awareness free awareness um, uh, sessions uh, about breast cancer uh, right. about mental health and mm -hmm. um, it be uh, with our doctors uh, right. for free sometimes right. we we attend the, for example the fun days in the company and mm -hmm. uh, communicate with the employees or, and some of them just ask us to send email with the details and uh, about a brief and presentation about the foundation and who wants to join, he uh, w will contact us. So we um, we communicate with the HR team, then check what is available for us, how we can communicate with the team. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's great that you mentioned that. I, I love the fact that you say, we're willing to provide like maybe like a workshop or some kind of a free um, preview of, as it were of what we do because that activation is very, very important, right? And that's kind of providing something before, like giving value before you, you ask for whatever you want. So I really think that's smart. And that was really in line with what you said earlier about the roses when you gave the flowers to the mothers, right? It was kind of creating goodwill. And I really like that you do that because I think too many times organizations are very extractive and transactional, not understanding that again, you need to build these relationships and kind of make those those uh, investments. So let's go on to Deanna. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And by the way, we do the same with some schools as well and faculties. Yes. Uh, we start with uh, free awareness about hygiene, for example, depending on the age, every age has uh, its own lectures for free. Uh, I believe the fundraising should give at the beginning, then people will trust him. Yes, absolutely. Um, Dan, I'm gonna I'm gonna just move to the because I've got two questions and I and I have three minutes. So um just quite quickly just to answer, Rogelio Marchetti asks, is interested in reading material recommendations on diaspora giving. And we have crowdsourced from all the speakers 
a great res uh, great document that will be shared in the um, email that's sent following this webinar. So you'll be able to get some readings um, um, from that. But I'm going to go to this question, which is anonymously asked, and it's highlighting that there is a lot of wariness among some donors, governments, etc., about current structures in place for remittances and diaspora giving like the Hawala system. What would you say to those hesitant about engaging with this type of structure to encourage their participation in giving? And do you encourage it at all? Asking this, um, knowing that in places like Sudan and Afghanistan can have sanctions and bank closures that make it impossible to get funding in a country and alternative systems like Hawala must be explored or used. So maybe Heba, you might be able to kind of answer this. Uh, uh, you mean pro how to pro to uh, provide the services for them uh, okay. while banking uh, are, is closed, right? Yes. How, what okay. kind of vehicles could be there if you can't go through traditional banking or traditional um, uh, giving mechanisms? Okay, we depend in this case on the uh, national NGOs communicating mm -hmm. with them. And, uh, and at the same time, using the uh, other uh, um, the other international uh, uh, entities like Red Cross, for example, now uh, in Gaza we send with Red Cross, so they we can send the medical aid, and uh, at the same time we communicate with the. Uh, um, with the local NGOs and in, in Gaza to send for them direct. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Um, I need to wrap this up, but I wanna just ask each one of our speakers to just give us what's one last piece of advice that you'd like to share with this audience before we go ahead and wrap up what has been an incredible conversation that would love to have all day long, but unfortunately we've only been given 90 minutes. So, Dan, would you like to start us off? Uh, I'm a big tools fan, so I would encourage you all to take a look at Giving Circles. I yes. think Giving Circles are amazing. Um, it, it addresses so many different issues um, that we're, we've talked about, including the transfer of funds. So there's ways to do that through a Giving Circle. Um, Philanthropy Together is a group that was started by the Gates Foundation. They are trying to build 5,000 Giving Circles in the next few years. Uh, they have a conference coming up. I would say, please take a look at Philanthropy Together. You know, figure out if you can include a giving circle in your networks. Um, it's a great way to bring donors together. Fantastic. Thank you very much on that. Um, and then let's go ahead and go to you, Martin, and then we'll finish up with Heba. Yeah, just a, a quick one for, for me. You know, look, let's let's not be too traditional in how we think about diaspora. I think we can we can use the word in very creative ways when we talk about you know, diversity, inclusion, belonging, you know, I think we're talking diaspora there when you begin to really unpack it, you know, so I think, you know, embracing the word a bit more, I think will build visibility, will bring more attention to it. Um, what, what I'll be happy to share as well is just on the resources as part of our diaspora training program, we put together a, a bibliography on diaspora and philanthropy. Uh, I apologize in advance because it is heavily academic. <laughs> but, <laughs> but look, I think it gives a good basis of, of you know, some of the contemporary stuff that's, that's being written on the topic. So uh, as I say, embrace the topic, diasporize other sectors, as I always say, and, you know, let people know that this is a phenomenal force for good in the world. Will be my I, love all, I love all your sayings. <laughs> 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 Thank you. And Heba, let's go ahead and wrap up with you, please. Okay. Um, I would like to confirm that to start with your repetition in your country first, and then by the word of mouth, you will get uh, the money from outside. And at the same time, study every country you want to communicate with people in it and um, what they need, uh, 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 what they worry about, and then uh, start to, to help them, and then you will get the funds you, you are looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much um, to all of you. And as we conclude this enlightening conversation, I want to, to express my heartfelt and our heartfelt appreciation to our esteemed panelists, Dian Yuan, Heba Rash Saeed Rashid, and Martin Russell. Your insights have been invaluable and your commitment to diaspora philanthropy um, is truly commendable. Uh, before we bring this webinar to a close, I'd like to mention, as I mentioned earlier, that 
in the follow-up email that you'll be receiving that, which, which will include a, um, a, a recording of this webinar, you will also receive a comprehensive resource document containing a wealth of uh, information related to today's discussion. So our speakers have provided us with different resources as well as the partners. And we encourage um, all of you to explore these valuable resources to further enhance your understanding of diaspora philanthropy. Uh, let's go ahead and, and harness the momentum generated during our discussion today to drive positive change within our communities and beyond. Now I'll pass the virtual stage back to Marina to conclude our session and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, and once again, thank you all participants for um, coming along with us on this fundraising journey. Um, as I mentioned, this is our last webinar of the year, but we will be back in 2024. Um, so please um, be on the lookout uh, for that follow-up email for the recording of for this session and resources, but also additional information. Um, thank you for your engagement. All of your questions were very thoughtful um, and helpful in leading the discussion. Um, if you have any ideas um, or any comments about what you would like to learn about um, in the future um, for our sharing best practices and fundraising discussions, please, please feel free to contact me um, and let me know. Um, and on behalf of KBFUS and give to asia thank you again for um, the panelists and for sharing your expertise. We've shared your contact info, um, so if um, any, of the, uh, any of the attendees would like to contact you, um, we, we welcome them to do that as well. Uh, but yes, thank you again very much. Uh, you will receive um, an email from me. Um, and if you would like to learn more about our services um, and what we do here at KBFUS and Give to Asia and have a more personalized discussion, um, my email is in the chat box as well. So please feel free to contact me. Um, and thank you to Liz and her team. Thank you to Lindsay, Sam, Ludmilla. Um, you did not see them, or at least uh, Ludmilla, Sam, and Lindsay much, but they were in the background helping us run the whole operation. Um, so thank you all once again. Have a great rest of your day, um, whatever time zone you're in. Um, and happy holidays as well. Um, and happy new year that's coming up. But thank you again. Um, Bye-bye.